Hello and welcome to Sit Sayas 21. I'm joining you this evening from the lands of the Gadigal and Bidjigal people of the Eora Nation. It always was and always will be Aboriginal land. My name is Alice Motion and I'm in this session, which is a huge pleasure. I'd like to thank our platinum sponsors, Atlas of Living Australia and the University of Sydney's Charles Perkins Centre for sponsoring this session. Today, we're going to hear from Dr. Dr. Karl Krozelnitsky. And if you have any questions for Dr. Karl, I'm sure many of you will, please feel free to use the question and answer function at any time to ask those questions. And I will try and come back to them at the end of the session. And now um, it just leaves me with an opportunity to present a person to who to present a person who needs little introduction, but I'll give him one anyway. Dr. Karl Krozelnitsky, AM just loves science to pieces. And he's been spreading the word in print, on TV and radio and online via social media for more than 30 years. Dr. Carl is the author of 47 books and counting. He's a lifetime student with degrees in physics and mathematics, biomedical engineering and medicine and surgery. And he's worked as a physicist, a laborer, a roadie for bands, a car mechanic, a filmmaker, a biomedical engineer, a taxi driver, a TV weatherman, and a medical doctor at the Children's Hospital in Sydney. Since 1995, Dr. Carl has been the Julius Sumner Milner Fellow at Ju Julius Sumner Miller Fellow, excuse me, at the University of Sydney. And in 2019, he was awarded the UNESCO Kalinga Prize for the Populari popularization of science. Gives me great pleasure to welcome Dr. Carl. Ahoy, look, thank you ever so much, Dr. Alice. It's such a kind introduction. Um, what you're seeing here is a whale shark uh, up off Christmas Island. It's amazing how close they are, you know, just maybe 200 metres off the coast. You can swim out and see them. But that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about Australian citizen science and then specifically the Sit Sci Oz 21 Association with a whole bunch of people. So as is the way with these things now, Alice, I'm sure we're still sticking to that agreement that you're going to give a prize of a luxury German sports car a block of flats in Tasmania to the person who can answer the following questions. So what is common to all of these? And okay, we won't give you time. You're looking at these cities and you're thinking there's New York over here, but what the heck is Mohenjo-Daro and Merv? Never heard of these places. What these cities have in common is that at one stage in the last five, 10,000 years, they were each the largest in the entire world and often the head of a giant empire and they faded away over time. Everything fades, except for cockroaches and frogs. So they're all in the Northern Hemisphere. What's in the Southern Hemisphere? Well, besides South America and Africa, there's Australia, which back in the 1920s, our th colonial masters thought was good for only one thing, which was wheat. There it is, wheat. And you can see over here the definition, that sort of hatched area is where you get lots of wheat and the surrounding lighter hatched areas where you get less wheat, but you're still getting wheat. But then what about the greenish sort of area? Well, that's sheep. And um, you can see that there's areas where there's lots of sheep. And the centre of Australia, most of Australia, half of Australia, well, according to our colonial masters back in the 1920s, it had no benefit whatsoever because you couldn't grow wheat or sheep. It had no sheep. That's all it was good for, no sheep. How little they knew. Okay, moving right along, and then we have, okay, no prize. What uh, is common to all of these states? And these states are the only states in the entire world that give you free education. So if any of you are worried about getting an education uh, and you haven't got quite enough money to get to university level, go to Denmark. They'll give you money to study. They'll teach you in the English language. They'll give you more money to rent a flat. And you can even buy a bicycle. The most livable city in the whole world. I love Copenhagen to pieces. And we should all have access to free education because we all matter. I had 28 years because I mattered and you matter. You matter until, of course, you multiply yourself by the speed of light squared and then u energy as in e equals mc squared yeah physics joke sorry about that and there's albert and albert came up with many brilliant concepts including the concept that if a mass accelerates changes speed or direction 
it gives off gravitational waves. And at the time, people thought we'll never be able to measure it, but we humans are pretty clever. And a century later, we managed to measure it. We measured that uh, a big event happened one and a half billion light years away, one and a half billion years ago, where a couple of black holes with masses around 30 times the mass of the sun slammed into each other to make another black hole with slightly less mass. Now, at this stage, I'll just stop for a second and point out two things. Number one, uh, the size of a black hole is zero, whether it's 10 times the mass of the sun or 10 billion times, it has zero size. Number two, our galaxy is pretty old, very old. It should have about a billion black holes. How many have we discovered so far? Three dozen, something's going on. Getting back here, you'll notice that we're missing three solar masses. And what happened to those three times the mass of the sun masses? They turned into pure energy in a tenth of a second. And in that tenth of a second, that event put out more power than 50 times every star in every galaxy in the entire known universe. Oh, my heavens, what a lot of energy that had. Um, it didn't do much of an effect on the gray space-time continuum because gravity, space-time continuum is pretty stiff. Anyway, moving right along, we've picked up a lot of events since then. And when one of these events happens over there, back here, space starts distorting, not just left and right, but also backwards and forwards and in and out, but also uh, up and down. Yeah, that's three dimensions. Okay, I've given you four. But also time starts stretching as well. And maybe we'll be able to measure the stretching of time next time a gravitational wave comes through. But at the moment, we've built this wonderful thing called LIGO, where we do gravitational wave laser interferometry. And we start off with a big fat laser beam over here, and we shine it on a mirror, and the beam splits. Part of it goes four kilometers, hits the mirror, and comes back and hits the detector. The other part goes straight up, hits the mirror, comes back for after four kilometers plus four, that's eight, and hits the detector. If nothing's going on, the hills of one wave match up perfectly with the valleys of another wave, and you get nothing. Most of the time, you're burning up power and you get nothing until a gravitational wave event happens. And then one of the arms gets a trifle longer or shorter, and then suddenly the waves are out of sync and you pick up a signal. And so we did this, and the Earth changed in size. Yes, our 12,500 kilometre diameter changed in diameter by two and a half times a thousandth of a millionth of a millionth of a metre, which is roughly two and a half times the diameter of a proton, but that's the whole Earth. The four kilometre laser arm, it changed in distance by one ten thousandth of the diameter of a proton. And we humans measured that. God, we're lovely. I'm so impressed. I didn't think it was possible, but we did it. So now that we've actually been able to detect gravitational waves, the ob obvious thing is how long before we can make gravitational waves, because a true focus of all this research was to make us a hoverboard, as in Back to the Future 3. But along with all of this scientific research, there's a kind of disquieting event. So going back in time, to the 14th of September on the year 2015, Tony Abbott, the then Prime Minister of Australia, got booted out. And a few hours later, a gravitational wave rippled through our space-time continuum. I know, it's obvious. The obvious question is this. Who wrote this gravitational wave paper? And the answer is, mate, bloody thousands of people, thousands of them, at thousands of institutions wrote this paper with a simple abstract. And if you look at the names of the first three authors, they are Abbott, Abbott, and Abbott. A coincidence? Maybe yes, maybe no. After all, there are 24 cans in a slab of beer and 24 hours in a day. A coincidence? I don't know. But one thing I do know is that coffee is a way of turning scientific abstract thought into concrete endeavour. Hail to coffee, the world's most popular legal drug. And the active ingredient in coffee is this stuff called caffeine. And you'll notice I've driven the formula over there. Now, Alice, of course, being a chemist, would know what it means. But for the rest of us, this thing here in the middle is called a xanthine, whatever a xanthine is. And that's called a methyl group. I knew that one, Alice. And that's a methyl, and that's a methyl, CH3. And because they're at the one, two, three, and seven positions, the chemical is called 137. Tri, that means three, 
methyls, that's those little groups, xanthine, that's a and it closes your blood vessels. On the other hand, there is another item available to the human race called chocolate. And it was so worshipped by Linnaeus, the god of botany, that he called the active ingredient theobromine, which literally means God, as in theology, and bromine to drink. And looking at the formula, you can see there's only two methyls. The third one's been replaced by an oxygen. And so this is called 3,7-dimethylxanthine, and it is a vasodilator, which opens up the blood vessels. Suddenly, everything begins to make sense. Coffee increases your blood pressure. Chocolate reduces your blood pressure. And now we have the answer to the problem that has bothered the philosophers for thousands of years. Yes, God does exist. And if she does exist, she wants you to have chocolate anytime you have coffee. There you have proof. But thinking about coffee, how many of you have either yourselves or heard somebody else say, Co coffee, caffeine is good? I don't think so. I might go on a co coffee-free period. Have you ever heard somebody say that? Probably. Is it what they should do? No. Caffeine is good for you. It improves your life expectancy and the results if you have liver disease and type 2 diabetes and like most males in the world, prostate cancer and also improves the outcome if you have heart disease or various cancers. But all of these results are based not on a proper randomized double blind control study, but on observational study. What's an observational study? Where, for example, the American Nurses Study, where you look at a third of a million nurses for a third of a century and things bubble to the surface. Like if you are a poor Afro-American female nurse living in the inner city, your life expectancy is less than if you're a wealthy white person living in private property in the country. If you smoke cigarettes, your life expectancy is less. Various things bubble to the surface, but you've got to remember, correlation is not causation. After all, there's a very, very good relationship between the um, divorce rate in the state of Maine and the weekly consumption of margarine across the entire United States. Does one cause the other? No. Is there a really good correlation? Yes. So that's why you need the randomized double blind controlled studies like this one here from Nature Medicine with the interesting title of a chronic low dose. Yeah, I think I understand that of Delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinol restores cognitive function in old mice. So, of course, it got reported in the media. Um, uh, a little cannabis every day might keep brain aging at bay. Brilliant, it even wrong. It doesn't say anything about mice. Marijuana may boost rather than dull the elderly brain. Okay, tiny mention of mice down here. This one lays it on the line. Marijuana improves the memory in old mice. That's right. So what did they do? They went to a whole bunch of mice of different ages and ages being young, mature and old. And 18 months is quite old and two months is quite young. And then they put a pump in their tummy, a little pump that would pump out either salt water, or which is a placebo, or salt water with a bit of cannabis in it. And they did this for a long time in the life of a mouse, you know, a month. Uh, or moons, by the way, which is how long it takes the moon to go around the Earth. But and we can talk about this later, but the moon doesn't go around the Earth. Okay, just, just putting it out there. Anyway, getting back to the story. So with the old mice, they found that the young, they, they regenerated their memory and learning skills to that of the young mice. The young mice, they were ripped off their little faces. And we can talk about that later. And we will. But it turns out that there's a big question. How come something from a plant acts on humans which are made of meat? And the answer is coincidence. You've probably heard of um, opiates. Well, they come from a little purple poppy in Turkey. And the reason that they work on humans is that we humans make our own opiates. Consider that word endorphin. What does it mean? It means endogenous morphine. And you get rid of the genus. So endo means from within. Genus means manufactured. Morphine is morphine. So you get rid of the end of one word and the beginning of the other, and you shorten it down to endorphin. That's why 
opiates work on us because we make our own endorphins and therefore, or opiates, and we have receptors for them. And that's why opiates relieve pain. And the same situation happens with cannabis because we humans make our own natural cannabinoid chemicals, marijuana type chemicals, which are important in everything from regulation of the type two immune response to chemical homeostasis, to growing new nerves, to programmed cell death, to catecholamine metabolic processes and everything else you can think of. It's an incredibly important chemical and we're just learning about it now. So in the case of you and me, as we get older, we lose a few synapses and a few nerve connections with the mice, give them a bit of cannabis, and they revert back to the number of synapses and nerve connections that the young mice had. Now, go away from nerves, go to DNA. What does DNA do? It expresses genes and makes proteins, and this gets weaker as you get uh, older. And then with marijuana, with cannabis injected or infiltrated into the older mice, they turn back into younger mice. So what is this endocannabinoid system? Well, it reaches a peak when you're young, especially around 12 to 25, and then it gradually fades away. Um, and the thinking is that maybe a low dose of cannabis could rejuvenate the older uh, endocannabinoid system and bring it back to what it was when somebody was younger. But there's a few disclaimers here, always disclaimers. Firstly, the good effects were very variable. So some of the older mice were going, yes, of course, it's obvious that E to the I pi plus one equals zero, especially when you look at it in a hydrokinetic situation with reference to Stokes laws. Whereas the others of the older mice were going, who am I? Why am I here? What is the meaning of life? Where's my daily coffee? The second thing is that mice are not humans, which is pretty obvious. And I'll give you an example. We humans get Alzheimer's disease and wait for it, so do mice. But we have found a thousand drugs, a thousand, that work really well on treating Alzheimer's disease in mice. In humans, 997 are really bad or poisonous or don't work, and three might work and might not. So what happens to mice might or might not happen to humans. Thirdly, don't forget what Paracelsus said. All drugs are poisons. What matters is the dose. And so too much of anything can be bad. And we don't know what that too much level is in most drugs that we haven't explored yet. And the other factor is that the human brain matures in the 20s, which is why it is not desirable entirely for people aged puberty to mid-20s to take drugs, but then they take alcohol, all that sort of stuff. We'll talk about that later. And part of the problem is that it can interfere with the memory, at least temporarily, in the younger people in that uh, puberty to 25-year-old group when they take cannabis. And we've all had that problem with memory ourselves, where you walk out the front door and you say, where do I park my bike or my car? Or you go into the kitchen to get a drink and you think, why am I here in the kitchen? Do I want a coffee or chocolate? I wonder. And then you think, oh, I went for a glass of water. You go back to what you were doing. And you think, what was I doing before I went to where I went, which I forgot what it was, is the problem that you are suffering dangerously low blood levels of cannabis, or perhaps you have early onset dementia? No and no. The problem is the evil doorway. Let me explain. Two things. First, the universe is dangerous. It's out to get you. Nothing personal, it's just business. So we always have to be keeping continually looking out for threats. And secondly, the universe is enormous, absolutely enormous. <laughs> So we have to simplify things down. We have to set up paradigms in our mind where we just go down pre-programmed pathways to make things easy. Mm. <coughs> Been doing too many radio shows today, <coughs> running out of throat. So I first came aware of this when I read a press release called Walking Through Doorways Causes Forgetting. And I thought, my heavens, what a good title that is. And of course, they got it by just stealing it from the paper, which was called Walking Through Doorways Causes Forgetting. And how they set up their study? Well, they had a house. And you can see where the walls are, standard symbol for a door or a window. And those X's, that's not standard. That's where they set up a bunch of tables. So here's two tables in one room. Here's another room with a couple of tables. That's a door there. That's a door. That's a window. Table, table. 
and that's another room with the two tables in it. So you would go on into the room, you'd pick up an item and put it into the backpack, and there were stupid items that you wouldn't normally deal with in different colours and different shapes, like a blue cube or a red wedge. And then you would, having put it in the backpack and no longer being able to see it, walk to a new location, sometimes in the same room, sometimes in a different room. And if you went through a doorway into a different room, you would forget. Let me show you. So here you are. You're starting off down here at this room. You put something in your backpack. You go step one, two, three. You had enable another table. You say, yeah, I've got a stupid yellow wedge. You take it out of your backpack. You did not forget. Hooray. Let's just vary it a bit. Let's go for a little walkie a bit further and walk an extra two steps into the next room and a third step. And there's another table. What happens? You forget. Did you forget because you walked into a different room? Or did you forget because you went through a doorway? So let's do what they call in Wollongong, where I grew up, a blocky, which is where you drive around the block with the radio, with a car, um, windows down, the radio up as loud as you can, one foot on the accelerator, one foot on the brakes, so the engine and gearbox are internally hemorrhaging. And you try to impress people with your choice of music loudly. Didn't work for me. So here you're doing a blocky. You start off over here and you go around the door and back into the room where you went, where you started off in. So you're still in the same room, but you've gone through two doorways. What happened? You forget. Let's just prove that. Ah, stay in the same room. Don't forget. So what's going on? Why does the doorway wipe your memory? And the answer is survival. Now, we humans split off from the chimpanzees about 7 million years ago. But thanks to two mutations 2 million years ago, we both, which were that we lost our body hair and started putting the protein into our brain. And secondly, that we modified our hips, evolved our hips so we could walk on our back legs and use our hands for other stuff. We left the jungle. Okay, while you're in the jungle, we had a five million year history in the jungle. While you're in the jungle, the threat is the killer gorilla. But once you start walking out on the open plains, if you're thinking about the killer gorilla, you're going to ignore the flash of khaki in the long grass, which is the lion. So very quickly, we had to evolve into completely forgetting the killer gorilla. When you change your environment, you forget certain things about the past. So you can concentrate on where you're going. So you're kind of like John Wick when you go into a new room. You've got your gun up and you're checking for threats from the killer dishwasher, the killer sink, the killer microwave, room clear, gun down. Now I'll get my, why, why am I here? You start thinking. So you forget because you've gone through this program. What is the treatment? Do you simply ban uh, doors and just go for an open plan house? Sure, I, I, I can go along with that. But what about when you're having a party? And everybody wants to go to the bathroom. And we're talking here about the phenomenon called breaking the seal, which for those of you who have never experienced it, I'll explain. So you're having a bit of a little drinky with your friends and everything's just nice and peachy keen. And then you feel this sudden desire to have a bit of a wee. So you go to the bathroom, you get there just in time, and you pass so much water that you think, oh, my God, I could have got friction burns on the inside of my urethra. And then even worse, you have to go back to the bathroom every couple of hours until sunrise. Have you broken the seal? No, I will explain that to you. There is no seal in your bladder system. I'll explain it to you in six words, separated by a comma, and here it comes, drink a six-pack, urinate a 10-pack. Six volumes go in, 10 volumes come out. And we're talking here about drugs affecting your body, and we're talking about volume, sheer volume. Now, affecting your body, in your body, um, hydration is incredibly critical. So depending on whether you're drinking lots or little water, you'll either have lots of urine with a very light colored urine or very little urine, with, which is very dark, just so you can keep your hydration constant, which I think sits around 294 milli, milli osmoles. I'm not entirely sure what a milli osmole is, but I'm fairly confident that it's a thousand times smaller than a regular osmole, whatever that is. And then the drugs such as alcohol affect it. You see, there's a hormone in your brain called antidiuretic hormone, which maintains your saltiness. And alcohol, that wondrous substance, which will strip 
um, oil stains off a garage floor, that you store an axolotl body part in a glass jar for a quarter of a thousand years and also make you less shy and more relaxed at a party will also interfere with this hormone. So specifically, if you drink 200 mils of beer, what comes out is 320 mils. Now, some of you who are thinking mathematically are saying, hang on, Carl, you've lied to us by mathematics, and I have. You see, if you go from 200 mils and you factor that up to a six-pack, well, then 320 should go to a 9.6-pack, but it doesn't scan. You know, drink a six-pack, urinate a 9.6-pack, nah, it sucks. So I had to lie for you for art. But secondly, factor besides the drugs is the sheer volume. When you're going around to meet somebody, they don't say, hey, we're going to have six pack of green tea, half a litre and six milkshakes. The sheer volume of what you're taking in is too much. And the volume thing kind of bothers me a bit, which is why I tend to go for higher octane, uh, slower volume drinks such as uh, rum and cola. And there's an interesting thing about this. It turns out that our society is so drenched in alcohol that we do not know the science of alcohol. So consider these two drinks, a rum and diet cola and a rum and regular cola. They both have the same amount of alcohol, but the diet drink gets you drunker. If you want to find out about it, go to my TikTok, uh, Dr. Carl, D-R-K-A-R-L, and join us in the 3 million people who have watched this video on why diet drinks get you drunker. And it's because there's different amounts of energy of stuff that ends up in your stomach. The paper is called Artificially Sweetened, which is fancy science talk for diet. Regular mixes means sugared uh, mixer, means uh, rum and cola. Gastric emptying, gastric is your stomach where the food gets emptied, where it gets absorbed into the small intestine, most of it, not all of it, but most of it, in the small intestine. And they're talking about this. And consider this. So your rum and diet cola's got a certain amount of calories. There's a lot of sugar in colas, 15 sugars per can. So when you have three rum and regular colas, virtually double the number of calories. Yes, alcohol has calories. I know. What was God thinking when she did that? I don't know. Anyway, now this was a surprise to me that the stomach pushes its contents into the next section, the small intestine, where it gets absorbed, not at a volume rate of so many mils or litres per minute or hour, but rather at a calorie rate, two to three calories per minute. How does it know to do that? I don't know. But the point is, if it stays in the stomach longer, if you've got a regular cola, you've got more calories. So roughly half as much alcohol gets pushed through in the same amount of time from your stomach. Plus, the longer that it stays in your stomach, the alcohol gets broken down. And then you can see the tragic result. What we have is two identical twins who have chosen to embark on this peer-reviewed, uh, randomized, double control study with a sample size of one plus one. Yeah, I know it sucks. So they go, both go to the party, have a bunch of regular colas. Well, one of them, one of them has regular colas and then ends up with a blood alcohol level going to 0.03, decides to go home, gets picked up by the cops, nothing happens, gets sent on their way. The other twin has a higher, there's the same amount of drinks, but ends up with a higher level. And you can see it's a bit later but of 0.05, they get picked up by the cops, which is the way it should be. And there's a bit, unfortunately, a miscarriage of justice. They end up in a cell for a rather long time with a very large person who has love and hate tattooed on their knuckles of one hand and the other and turns out to be a sergeant in the local Hells Angels chapter and inducts our poor twin as a nom who then ends up when they get let out of jail getting a Harley Davidson as a very junior nom and sitting on the Harley Davidson with the engine idling loudly with their big beer belly and sitting squirting outside of their leather vest trying to sell methamphetamine to your nieces and nephews because our society doesn't teach people that alcohol diet drinks make you drunker so there is your message of good hope you have learned this and stay with it Diet drinks make you drunker, so learn how to compensate for this so that you have a better life. I have a few other messages of good hope. We can stop and reverse rising carbon dioxide levels and climate change. We are living in the most peaceful time in history. Each generation is smarter than the one before, and we can fix COVID-19. Let's start on climate change. So um, the history is that but the fossil fuel companies in the 1970s and the 1980s did the best research in the world on climate change. They accepted that it was real. And then suddenly in 1990, chucked a U-turn and then started spending up to a billion dollars a year to cover it up. 
naughty, naughty, evil fossil fuel companies. Number two, where does the heat of global warming come from? Does it come from burning fossil fuels? No. Carbon dioxide acts like a one-way valve. It lets the heat of the sun come in, but not go out. And so each day, carbon dioxide traps 400,000 atom bombs of heat. You can get away with that for a week, a day, a week, a month, a year, maybe a decade, maybe a couple of decades, but you do it for a bunch of decades, mate, you're not going to get away with it. And so we've seen things happen. Why are people doing it? Because the energy in a barrel of oil, 50 bucks, is equal to the energy that a labourer can put out over 10 years, $500,000. That's why we went for fossil fuels, because they're just loaded with energy. The effects of climate change are that besides making Sydney the hottest place on planet Earth on the 4th of January last year, um, with a temperature of just under 50 degrees, um, we have also burnt one-fifth of all the forests in Australia, including rainforests that have never burnt in their 10 to 20,000 year history at least, as well as we've tipped the Earth off its axis. Um, and can we fix climate change? Yes. Go to this uh, document here, Drawdown Review, uh, and it's a pretty good document. It'll take you a little while to read, maybe three or four hours uh, from drawdown.org. And it deals with a full, rounded international viewpoint on how to fix things. First, we reduce the sources and bring everything down to zero. Yes, no more burning of fossil fuels. And then we start sucking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere with both natural sinks and military industrial sinks, whatever it takes. And that will improve our society. And so we can reduce our emissions to zero and bring carbon dioxide levels and the climate to back to what they were in the last century. Go to drawdown.org for the international view. For the local Australian view, go to bze.org.au who have written this wonderful document, Zero Carbon Australia Research, The Million Jobs Plan. And they look at so many different aspects of our society, how we can become a powerhouse of renewable energy into the next century and beyond, and at the same time, create millions of jobs. Fossil fuels have hardly any jobs at all. They're massively over-mechanised, or not just over-mechanised, just mechanised. And best of all, these jobs will be local. There's none of this fly-in, fly-out stuff where you fly out for four, three weeks and come back for one week and you earn lots of money and then shortly after the family splits up because they're not there for 75% of the year. We need action, not just at a citizen level or local government or state government, but a high federal level. The sort of action that happened on after the 7th of September 1940 when Pearl Harbor got bombed. Up until that day, the United States had manufactured 3,000 aeroplanes in the previous century. And after that, in the next four years, they went from 3,000 to 300,000. From 3,000 planes in half a century to 300,000 planes in the next four years. Big, heavy planes with big, powerful engines that had a huge range. And the federal government in America said to the car companies, just go to some naked soil, some naked ground, and turn it into a factory to make aeroplanes. And so one such factory turned out to be the largest single-story building in the whole world a kilometre long, a third of a kilometre wide. And this factory was pumping out aeroplanes, not at the rate of one per month or one per fortnight or one per week or one per day, one per hour. And compared to cars, these were high-tech aeroplanes. 500,000 parts instead of 15,000 parts, high-tech material, skilled labour. And you're saying, come on, Carl, you're expecting me to believe that the fossil fuel companies are lying to us. I know that big tobacco lied to us, but not fossil fuel. I mean, they're nice. Yeah. Well, what about this poster that appeared courtesy of big alcohol in every hospital in Australia in 2018? And it was replaced by the one on the right. And the one on the left has got three paragraphs. And the first paragraph says, it's not known if alcohol is safe to drink while you are pregnant. That is a complete and utter lie. We've known it's a lie for about a quarter of a century. It is known that alcohol is unsafe to drink while you are pregnant. Now, what was going on? Was big alcohol specifically trying to increase the number of mentally retarded, physically deformed babies being born to pregnant women? No, that was just a collateral effect. 
What they really wanted was that pregnant women would start drinking alcohol. And why? Well, in the words of the Godfather, it's not personal. It's strictly business. It's not personal. It's strictly business. So we can go to a zero carbon world for electricity in 10 years if we try steel and concrete 15 percent of the world's carbon dioxide 10 years transport 15 years because we have to go hydrogen for long-haul transport like ships and airplanes livestock within five to 20 years there's nothing stopping us except the political will or non-will we can do it nothing stopping us don't need new technology we just need different politicians second message of good hope is we are living in the most peaceful time in human history and you're thinking come on that's not possible read the book the better angels of our nature by stephen pinker who has firstly more hair than i do and has written a book with more pages than i write 1024 and he deals with the big stuff and the small stuff like wars and personal stuff and looking at wars people wrongly claim that the second world war was the most bloody war in the history of the human race on a percentage basis? No. If you go back to the year 755 AD, in that year, the Chinese emperor, to put down the An Lushan revolt, killed one in every three people in China, one in every 16, one in every six people in the whole world. The Mongol conquest of the 13th century killed one in every nine people. World War II, one in every 44. Still high, but going down. And if you look at the small scale, murders are going down, judicial torture, only one country still doing it, executions for crimes other than murder, slavery, it's all going down. Why do you wrongly believe that things are so bad? Because of the motto of the commercial media, which is if it bleeds, it leads. If there's some blood involved, that'll go first. We don't care about the truth. Second message of good hope is that we're living in the most peaceful time. Third one is that you are smarter than anybody ever in the history of the human race the Flynn effect. Here's Flynn. And what's an IQ test? Well, you give people a test and then you adjust the scale left and right. So the average is 100 and then you expand or compress the results so that two thirds of the population fit between 85 and 115. And over here at 110, average IQ in that two thirds is me, Dr. Carl. However, a few years ago, I was invited to the University of the Sunshine Coast where I walked around on stage and they gave me this wonderful olive green velvet gown and a beautiful cap and a bit of paper. And on the paper, it said that I was a doctor of the university. I've got to tell you the truth. It wasn't real. It was only honorary, but it still says doctor. Therefore, I am no longer Dr. Carl, but actually Dr. Dr. Carl. Dr. Dr. Give me the news. I got a bad case of loving you. Moving right along. So IQ tests are calibrated to give an average of 100. The whisk is what most people have had. And they've recalibrated upwards through various versions because each generation is getting smarter by about nine points. We know this from Flynn's work, looking at the IQ tests done on the American military under hard military conditions on the tens of millions of people who went in from 1932 onwards. And it's happening not just in America, but around the world. And so the IQ is going up by 0.3 of an IQ point every year, or roughly nine IQ points every generation across, averaged out across the whole different subsets. Why? We don't know. It's a mystery. It's real? Yes. Why? We don't know. Maybe it's because back in 1900, only 3% of people had jobs involving thinking, and now it's 33%. Or maybe it's because we've gone more abstract. So if you go to a high school student of 1920 and say, could you tell me about the difference between a cat and a dog? They say, back in 1920, the dog chases the cat. Whereas now they'd say, well, obviously, they're both family lactating quadrupeds. Are you interested in their physiology of lactation, similarities and differences, or their effect upon the family dynamic with regard to social benefits, or perhaps their greenhouse effects? We don't know. But we know that it's real, even if we don't know what's going on. And the last message of good hope is that we can fix COVID-19. Here it is with all the spikes sticking out of it. And you might have heard, this was started off by L. McPherson's boyfriend, that uh, vaccines cause autism, complete lie. L. McPherson's boyfriend told a lie all those decades ago, and he's still telling the same lie. No, it turns out vaccines do not cause autism. They don't. However, according to a very highly reputable source, otherwise known as breakfast, Saturday morning breakfast cartoon, 
autism spectrum people are overrepresented in research, which means, OMG, that people with autism cause vaccines and that they also save babies. Okay, now that we've got that out of the way, let's give you the cure. It turns out that the most widely used vaccine on planet Earth has been used against the coronavirus for half a century. And you're thinking, COVID's only been around for two years and it saves billions of lives every year. And you think there's only 8 billion people on the planet. Yes, it saves billions of lives of chickens. Humans and chickens have been infected with coronavirus for thousands of years. And in 1937, one of these coronaviruses in chickens mutated to kill chickens. It could infect 100% of a flock within a day and kill them with lung and kidney disease. And if they came into your area, you just had to kill all the chickens, burn them, bury them. And we were very happy. We worked fast. We managed to get the first commercial vaccine 50 years ago. Chicken numbers were dropping. So the situation today is that the coronavirus did not get less lethal. It's just as lethal. And there are hundreds of variants of this coronavirus ranging the world trying to kill chickens. And to stop that, we've got a bit under 100 different vaccines. And we use different mixtures of the vaccines to put back the different varieties. And as a result, we've gone from having hardly any chickens to the situation where there are so many chickens that the weight of all the chickens on earth is greater than the weight of all the other birds put together. Why? Because every single commercial chicken is vaccinated on the day it hatches. We spray it into the air and they either breathe it in or get off their feathers. And then every two weeks for as long as they live. And if we did not have the vaccines, if we did not have the vaccines, this would mean that there'd be no such thing, and I know this is going to break your heart, there'd be no such thing as a chicken schnitty a chicken, roast chicken, a baked chicken, a fried chicken, or even, horror of horrors, chicken soup. The only reason we have chickens today in commercial quantities is because of the vaccines. So we can do the same for humans, and we have to, because a few hours ago, about a quarter of a billion people had been reported as being infected, not the ones infected, the ones officially reported with blood tests. About 5 million of those had died But luckily, a bit under 7 billion had been vaccinated. And going back over time, you can see we had, beginning in 2020, we had a first wave, a second wave, and a third wave in terms of weekly cases, up to around 6 million a week. Deaths, up to about 100,000 a week in a first wave very early on, then a second and a third wave, and a fourth wave now. And why is the fourth wave so small? Big it up for vaccines. Love a good vaccine. So the situation is that every year you'll get a bunch of vaccines that will work against the current strain sounds just like the flu shot. Yes, the difference is that you'll go in the future to your GP who will have your own personal DNA and say, ah, Dr. Alice, Professor Alice, she's a professor, Professor Alice, here's your DNA and I can see that you've got certain strengths and weaknesses in your immune system on the short arm of chromosome 6 on the, with human, human-like leukocytic antigen, but you've got strengths and weaknesses and then They'll say, where are you going, Professor Alice? Ah, you're going on holidays to Wollongong and to Hawaii. And I work out what variants of COVID-19 are there. And then using a 3D printer in the doctor's surgery on the spot will print out a bunch of vaccines tailored for you and where you'll be in the next six months. And we'll have to do this. We'll start doing it in the next decade or so. And we'll have to keep on doing it for either the indefinitely like the chickens or maybe the virus will mutate either way we can win and welcome folks to citizen science 21 after a long day thank you very much and if you can take me out of screen sharing mode i'd be ever so thrilled thank you the carl i think i i feel i feel exhausted and exhilarated by that journey through all things science and i can see that people are very much enjoying have been very much enjoying this on Twitter and we have lots of questions for you Dr. Carl so um, if you're game I'm going to to have a go I'm going to start off with a question from Jock Uh, it's Jock's question space dominates popular science is the human fascination with deep space exploration and space tourism and the resulting funding committed to space research misplaced given that there are issues here on earth worthy of our focus apart from the obvious desire to have hoverboards um big with you on the hoverboards um it turns out that the money spent on a on on space travel has given us weather satellites and the weather satellites have given us 
knowledge about the oncoming weather, which on one hand has saved millions of lives and on the other hand has reduced global warming by directing aeroplanes onto flight paths where they'll have fewer headwinds. So the return from space travel, of which communication satellites and weather satellites is a tiny part, has more than compensated for the cost of all those deaths. So space is a worthwhile investment in the future. However, you should know that of all of the revenue generated by all of the governments on Earth, 8%, and this is according to the International Monetary Fund, in papers in 2013 and 2019, 8% of all of the revenue generated by all the governments on Earth is given as a free present to the fossil fuel companies. The space program at its maximum was 2% of the American budget for about eight years. Worldwide, it's about a tenth of a percent. Fossil fuel companies, they get 8%. You want some money to fix up the problems of the world? Read the reports by the International Monetary Fund and they're called, they have the title of Energy Subsidy Reform. Read them and weep. So we've been sent to some reports. I think, Dr. Carl, because we were in space with that question, I'll come to Amy's question, who would like, um, in fact, her husband has a question and and Amy has kindly typed it in there. And that is that I've heard that there are plans to try and measure gravitational waves with multiple satellites orbiting the sun. Correct. That is correct. Um, What we've got on Earth is that the wave, sorry, that the path that we measure the change in distance is four kilometres long. If we have a longer path, say 400 or 4,000, or 4 million kilometres, firstly, we increase our sensitivity. So we can pick up the same distance change, but over a much bigger distance, but also we change the frequency. So we can pick up different sorts of gravitational events, such as lighter stars, planets running into each other, or somebody in the gym waving their weights as they go up and down. It gives us benefits both ways. We're going down that pathway. So I believe this the space um, the space probe um, that's that's proposed is called um, a laser interferometer space antenna or a LISA. So I think it's only right that we go to LISA next um, in our questions, Dr. Carl. So LISA has a question. Um, they would really like to know: um, Do you have um, do you have a any examples of stories that you've had to update over the years? You you know we mentioned that you've been uh, working in this space for 30 years. Um, how many stories have you had to update over the years because our understanding of the science has changed? Um, a significant number, which is not a good number. I'm guessing maybe half a percent. So for many years, I wrongly said, wrongly, that the reason that you get wrinkles on your hands and feet when you're in the bath or the ocean for a long time is because your hands and feet are work areas, have got lots of callus on them, and the callus absorbs the water and wrinkles. And this was the standard scientific explanation that's still given today. And then I read a paper that was written maybe 20 years ago, which said, no. And I thought, oh my God, they're right. And so what they are saying is that you wrinkle your hands and feet because you are having a sympathetic nervous system response to a threat. The threat is this. Your sweat glands are very rich in number, very high in number on your hands and feet. Lots of sweat glands. And they work both ways. Blood gets turned into sweat and leaves your body, but also water, fresh or salt, can go into your body. And just around the base of the sweat gland, it can dilute the local saltiness. Your body sees this as a threat and kicks in the so-called sympathetic nervous response, which is used as a way to deal with a threat. And so what happens is your pupils get larger, so more light comes in. The blood supply to your muscles is increased so you can fight. And the blood supply to your skin is reduced so that in that fight, if you happen to get cut, you don't bleed so much. And how do we know this is the case? Because 
the sympathetic nervous system has one side here and one side there. And there are a very small number of people who, either through birth or some sort of trauma, have lost the sympathetic nervous system on one side of their body and can't sweat on that side of their body. And when they go into the water, that side of the body does not wrinkle on the hands and the feet, but the other side does. Whoa. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I often say I'm wrong on Twitter, uh, probably about once every two months or once every month, and I, I do so early and I, and I try to set the record straight. That's a good thing about scientists that you would appreciate, Professor Alice, that scientists are about the only bunch of people who say, yeah, you know what, you were right and I was wrong. Thank you for setting me straight. Yeah, it's an important thing to do. It would be good if we encouraged, I think, if we encouraged a little bit more of that, that it's okay to say I'm wrong or that I don't know. Um, Erin has a question for you, um, Dr. Carl, that I think expands on, on that point. Erin's mm -hmm. particularly interested in hearing from you, um, a fantastic science communicator. Do you have any science communication tips and tricks for people who are trying to engage community science? Could you give us some pointers? Um, yes, uh, second pointer is um, contact me directly through the University of Sydney. Just ring up the switchboard and ask them to put you through to my phone and I can do some mentoring for you on a personal basis. I do this. And also, Professor Alice, you also run a mentorship program, don't you? Yeah, try to, trying to get some particularly um, stu students out there to do more science communication, students and young people. So approach both of us. We're both on the switchboard at the University of Sydney. And then second, the first thing is you've got to tell a story. So the human brain is wired up to remember stories that have a beginning and a middle and an end. So start off with something amazing, um, like a cat can survive a fall better from 32 stories than from seven stories. Wow. Then explain it so people feel smarter and they love feeling smarter and finish off with a joke. Maybe they jump by themselves or maybe they were pushed. So get in contact with both of us and we'll do what we can to help you on the pathway. Yep. Stories can be very powerful. I, I agree with you there, Dr. Carl. I think it's a really great way to package facts and figures up and to hook them into people's emotions. So um, it's great to hear those stories. Um, I have another question for you. I think this is going to be the final question so that we can finish in time for you to enjoy some supper and for other folks to, to go and continue with their evenings. Um, we have, Lisa would like to know a little bit more about something you said in your talk. You said, we lost our hair and started putting the protein into our brain. That's too interesting not to explain. It's a little poem from Lisa. Could you tell us a bit more about uh, the protein from our hair and um, and if it ended up in our brain and how that happened? Well, you did mention poem. So Lisa, if you'd like to record this talk and then turn it into a found poem, you too can get attacked by people from the Institute of Public Affairs, such as Jared Henderson. Do you know he attacked me for reading a poem? Attacking a poetry, that's art. Oh my God, I love you, Jared, but don't attack poetry. So moving right along. So we humans sort of began a bit like maybe, okay, let's go back to 65 million years ago, the dinosaurs died out except for birds, which are still dinosaurs. 55 million years ago, the biggest primate was about so big. Yeah, not very big. They evolved. And about 7 million years ago in Africa, the line that would become you and me split off from the chimpanzees. We didn't evolve from the apes, different line. We didn't evolve from the chimpanzees. We split off from them. The chimpanzees stayed as chimpanzees and we stayed pretty much the same for about 5 million years in the trees, just a different sort of chimpanzee, similar. And then 2 million years ago, two things happened. Firstly, over a bit of a time period, Firstly, we had a mutation that we lost our body hair. Now, you might go to the beach and see a really hairy person. They are not hairy at all compared to a dog, right? So we lost our body hair. Hair is made of protein. And for whatever reason, it started going into the brain. So beginning about 2 million years ago, our brain began to get bigger and bigger. And this thing here at the front, instead of being angled back like that, began to come forward and forward and forward until it was more vertical. Secondly, 
we started walking on our back legs due to a mutation in our hips. And as a result, we humans can do this, which a chimpanzee cannot do. A chimpanzee has a thumb and forefinger, but it doesn't have the brain wired up to do this. See that? That's very powerful. If you see them doing very fine surgery, often they'll just do rolling motions when they're doing microsurgery because we can do that with a great deal of control. So beginning 2 million years ago, our brain got bigger and bigger. Oh, and then about 600,000 years ago, uh, we evolved into um, Homo hydrobergensis, who was like us, a bit smaller, smaller brain, but we're pretty sure they had language. We can talk about that later. And then finally, about 200,000 years ago, we came along went through a bit of a genetic bottleneck uh, about 70,000 years ago in the middle of an ice age. Uh, ice age is a real, yep. When uh, a mountain in Indonesia exploded, Mount Toba, threw about 1,000 cubic kilometres of stuff into the atmosphere, cooled down the earth during an ice age, and the human population dropped down to about 2,000. Now, here's the weird bit, Professor, Hella, uh, Professor Alice. I, like all males, am descended from just one of those males. Whereas you, uh, I'll switch that off too. Yep, okay, here we go, and off. Uh, whereas uh, you are descended from, all of the, all women are descended from a thousand of those women. Now, it's not as though one bloke said, look, the other 999 of you go off and build a fence while I check out these other creatures, but something happened. We don't know what happened. And here we are today thinking that we are the peak of human evolution because we have invented poetry, income tax, and weapons of mass destruction. Well, that was a, that's a, a great point to end on. I think we'll focus on the poetry um, and hopefully we'll see much more of that over the next few days. Dr. Carl, um, it's a pleasure to have hosted you this evening. Thank you so much on behalf of um, AXA and the SITSIOS 21 um, folks who've joined you this evening for your fantastic uh, presentation. Um, we, we're, we're all giving you a very warm digital round of applause. You just can't Aww. hear us, but it's definitely happening. Um, so thank you so much. Thanks everyone for joining us this evening. Um, it's now time to um, uh, head off to our evenings to think about what we've learned today, to think about um, the things, the people we've met um, and to return again to our uh, conference. I think it's half past 10 tomorrow morning. Um, we hope to see um, you online. And this talk will be available as a recording on the platform in around about 48 hours time. So thank you very much. Bye.